Okay, um, hello everyone. Um, my name is Chris Johnson. I am the Interim Executive Director of the Georgia Mental Health Consumer Network, and I am a um, person in long-term recovery from mental health concerns. What that means for me is it's been over 14 years since my mental health challenges prevented me from leading a full productive and rewarding life and getting to do things like be here today with you to um, share in the experience of learning about respite. Um, I'm joined by my colleague, Rosalind Hayes, who I hope is not having the technological difficulties I seem to be having here today. But um, Roz, are you with us? I am, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay, can great. Be seen and heard today, so that's awesome. Great. I'm Rosalind Hayes. I am also a person in long-term recovery. And what it means for me is that it's been about 13 years since my mental health concerns have prevented me from suiting up and showing up for my life. Um, I'm excited to be here. I'm grateful to uh, Sarah, to Zay, and to Shireen for joining us for the fourth installment in our uh, series on peer-run respites. And I, I'm so excited about what I know is going to be an awesome conversation. Thank you all for being here. And we will First, before we get started, we want to let everyone who's on the webinar who is looking for CEUs, we want to let you know that at the very end of the webinar, there will be uh, an evaluation that is going to be posted. You have to stay on until the end, complete the evaluation, and that is how you will be able to receive your CEU certificate or, or whatever it is that lets you have CEUs. So I wanted to get that out of the way. and. Um, We'll start with introductions um, and we can just start, we can go with Sarah, Zay, and then Shireen. Hi, thanks so much, Roz and Chris, for having me back here. And my name is Sarah Davidow. I use she, her pronouns. I am a part of the Wildflower Alliance, which has been in formal existence to, since 2007 and includes a FIA peer respite since 2012. Thank you. Hi, I'm Zeo Coronto, pronouns are they, them, and I'm a peer services director. I oversee Solstice House Peer Run Respite and Peer Support Line in Madison, Wisconsin. Hi, everybody. My name is Shireen Carrico. I use she and her pronouns. I am the CEO of Promise Resource Network out of Charlotte, North Carolina. We have been in existence since 2005, and we operate Retreat at the Plaza Peer Run Respite. Awesome. Thank you all. Chris, if you want to, if you want to take it from there, please. Okay, I, I will. I will do that. And um, let's see here. Let me pull my questions up. Here we go. Um, first off, thank you all for being here. It's so good to have such great partners in this work that we do. Um, but before we look forward, and I know we're talking about the future today, I did want us to just um, take a look back, just a, just a minute, um, and I'd like to ask each of you to reflect on um, what are the biggest changes you've seen in respite since you became familiar with this work, and um, starting with, like, let's start with the changes that you believe are or will be a benefit to peers, and um, then we'll go on to the other side, but let's start with, I guess, what's working um, where you are. And who wants to kick us off? How about Shireen? Because you're in the middle of my Christ. screen. That's perfect. No, that works great. So I, for me, one of the advantages is that peer-run respites are um, becoming more uh, well-known. There is more awareness. There is definitely more validity. Uh, I have seen more recently a rise in, in the recognition and the validity of peer-run respites. There's a rise in interest in funding for peer and respite. So I think that is definitely a positive. And I, I know for me, I just ended a six month intense feasibility study out of Maryland, Maryland um, with Baltimore City, Baltimore County, Howard County, and Carroll County, where we spent six months doing a feasibility study for peer and respites. And that was a, a very intentional, thoughtful process to examine the role of peer and respites as a part of their community array. Uh, whether it would be beneficial um, and to to get community buy-in. I would not have seen that certainly a year ago. And is that report out? Is that publicly available? Something we could look at? Because I'm fascinated by that would look it is, like. It is coming soon. It's actually a two-part report. So the per first part is a feasibility study. The second part is a business plan 
where we designed um, for the region, for any peer-run organization that is interested, they could pick it up and actually uh, begin to replicate peer-run respite um, that was tailored for their community based on the last six months of gathering data. We've, we have spoken to over 270 folks in that region. We have gone to a variety of different locations, including peer-run organizations, some emergency departments, crisis stabilizers, inpatient settings. So it was a very intentional process that they embarked on to be able to examine um, the advantages and some of the challenges that might exist to bring up peer and respites in their area. Awesome. Okay. Who wants to go next? How about Zay? Sure, yeah. Um... So sorry, are we ask, are we saying what's going well or are we saying um well, what's going well? Yeah. Yeah, I would say um like Shireen said, you know, visibility. Um I think what I think is going the most well in Wisconsin, at least, is the desire for peer respite from the community. Um, people realizing what kind of support they truly want, what is truly helpful, um, and watching more people with lived experience really band together in solidarity and create alternatives that we need. Um I I don't pay much attention to what's going well in the overall system. I don't know that much is going well right now, but I think the community is doing a tremendous job of remaining um, rooted in pure values here in a, in a grassroots sense and becoming creative with how we navigate the barriers that come up systemically, um, including things we'll talk about later like legislation and uh, social politics and some of the pushback we get um, and the, the leaning toward co-optation. So, okay. Awesome, thank you. And finally, Sarah. Yeah, so I'd echo some of what's already been said. I, I do think that the energy around desire for peer respite has grown as more people become aware of it. Some of that is because there's some really useful research that has developed over the last handful of years that gets the attention of folks who might just not be as inclined to just listen to us. So that's been really helpful. So. Live and Learn has done some really good work. Uh, Human Services Research International has done some good work in supporting the idea that peer respite should be taken seriously. But there's also become this critical mass of just people in the community, both in Massachusetts and I would say nationally as well. And once there's enough people, you can start really building momentum to, you know, getting our voices heard. So I think that that's, that's been really great. And I know that when we first started in 2012, we were number 13 in the country for peer respites. And we had to have a lot of conversations with people like crisis teams and all that saying, no, we're just, we're not just for the people who you think aren't actually in crisis. No, we can be a crisis alternative. No, we're doing serious work. Yes, we know what we're doing. Like we had to have a lot more of those conversations. We still have to have some of those conversations, but not as often now. So I really appreciate that. That's awesome. Ross, do you want to jump in for Georgia Mental Health Consumer Network? Um, I, it, it, it's pretty much the same as far as desire. Ever since we opened the first center um, in, in Decatur, there's been, you know, any, any place we'd go, there'd be, you know, how can we have a respite center in our area? We really want one in our area. And so the desire is there. Um, and at the same time, it seems as the, the desire in the community continues to grow, um, questions amongst the, the, the department and, and the, you know, legislature seem to grow as far as the feasibility and, and, and the viability of our services. And so, you know, finding ways to um, satisfy and, and to show that this is something that is necessary, um, you know, for our communities is, is I think our biggest challenge, you know, to really convey the, the, the value of our services to, you know, the powers that be as it were. Okay, so it seems like, yeah, and uh, I agree with that. And I think, you know, for, for us, anytime we can get someone like a politician or a leader to go with us to a center, it changes their mind or yeah. it moves them further. It more becomes, they become more of a super fan. And I think that's what it's gonna take, at least in Georgia to push us where we need to go is like getting those super fans that also happen to be in seats of power. Um, but we shall see where that goes, but that's, you know, changes that have happened, you know, recently that you believe are either a barrier to recovery um, 
or an outright you know, like detriment to the mental health community, the recovery movement as it relates to respite? Like what, what have you seen like where you are that would qualify as like, you know, that the thing that's been a negative in your world? I saw Sarah call real quick. <laughs> Good. Sorry. <laughs> I'm just trying to make sure we don't spend a lot of time staring at each other saying who's next. So uh, I would say almost the same exact answer. There's more interest in peer respite, which means that there are more people who don't understand peer respite who want to get in on it. And the risk of co-optation and the occurrence of co-optation has gone up substantially. And it's something we're really going to have to pay attention to and push back on hard, hopefully using that national uh, traction that we do have to get our collective voices together to push back on it. Yeah, and I would I would echo that, Sarah, and uplift what you said. I'm very concerned about the co-optation of peer respites, just like I've seen the co-optation of peer support in general. It becomes popular. It becomes trendy. Um, people don't understand the nuance of what it means, how to do it well, the integrity of doing it well, what the intention is. That if we don't have universal standards, not that I'm, I am an advocate for uber structuring things, but in these um, situations, I think if we do not have universal standards that we agree upon that come from our community, by our community, and with our community, somebody else will create them. And they create narratives that are inconsistent and incompatible with what a peer run respite is. We have seen recent funding come out of other states that when you look at the funding, while it says that they're funding peer run respites, really what they're funding is provider led crisis um, institutional residential programs that maybe hire people that call themselves peer supporters, but um, they're talking about everything from shared bedrooms to clinical assessments on the front end, to clinical oversight of the program, to organizations that are housed underneath health agencies, but higher peer um, supporters. So there is a very significant concern that I have right now that we are at, a, at this, um, this, this point where we are either going to lose it, like we've lose many, lost many things that started out very authentic, and the train is leaving the tracks, it's left the station, and it is just getting momentum, momentum, and momentum. And to, I was going to say the highest bidder, but frankly, the lowest bidder. Um, if we do not define what it is and it is not owned by our community. Yeah, I would agree with what you both said. Um, I think on top of that, not just the desire for peer respites, but a fundamental misunderstanding of what the respite terminology means in the peer support context. I think the lack of clarification around the definitions and like the true intentions is there. Um, it being inappropriately conflated with, you know, a respite for a separate purpose, I think as well. Um, something I've even thought of is like, how long can we keep using this language similar to warm line and peer support line? Um, I'm seeing a lot of people crop up with things they're calling peer respites when they have no connection to peer support, potentially. They have no connection to peer community. They're not peer supporters actually even, but they're called peer respites because it's, you know, let's say a social justice organization with a cause that's toward an underserved group. Um, and it's happening in my community, you know, creating a respite, not informing anyone of that, not asking anyone for support and starting up, just having an idea with an intention and thinking that it's just a house, not what happens in the house or the community that's created in the house based on that uh, shared set of values. So I think a lot of it is, um, I don't know if it's, an ignoring of history, but um, it's an overzealousness of it's an eagerness to get involved without knowing the true impact of what that means and a recognition for um, the programs that are actually going to suffer the consequences of some of that excitement without education. And before we go forward, just if, in case there's someone who's joining us um, for the first time, they haven't been on any of the previous uh, webinars, and somebody share, you're talking, you know, you speaking to you know what it what respite means you know at its core um will somebody like share what that is what is respite what is the original intent um and, and things like that for someone who might just be joining us for the first time and maybe they're confused let's let's educate a little bit and zay or shireen zay go ahead 
Yeah, I think like the way that I understand it, at least, and I, I don't want to speak for folks that have more historical background than I do, so please correct me. Um, for me, it's it's truly an alternative option for people who are you know seeking a diversion from a hospital setting, um, not wanting to have a situation where something happens that's not in their control. So um, I see it as a grassroots, community-based support network, um, a standalone, hopefully a freestanding house that is made by the members of the community for the members of the community to address and offer care in times of crisis, distress, emergency, or just in times where someone needs a space to be exactly who they are without question or concern of things like surveillance, control, seclusion, restraint, um, being assessed. There's, it's a non-clinical, um, you know, peer-based support um, offering, I would say. But what we see is respites becoming, you know, institutionalized and then pandering to the needs of the system. And sometimes the agendas of our own communities, because that's my other challenge is people utilizing respite for things outside of what a respite's truly meant to, meant to offer. Um, and I have conflicting feelings around things like family respite and, you know, things that are outside of peer support scopes, but are still being used as respite called respite. So it is for people that have lived experience. Um, I don't know how I feel about the, the other versions of respite that I hear. It's not what I'm here to talk about today, at least. <laughs> Thank you, Zay. And Shireen or Sarah, if there's any, anything else you want to add to that, please do so. Yeah, I don't disagree with anything that Zay said. I think we have to be careful. It's one of those things that we don't want to overdefine and start to limit and require someone to use peer respite in this very constricted, prescriptive kind of way. But I do think it's, you know, the mental health system has ultimately been designed to take so much power under the guise of helping. And I think peer respite is really designed as a way to create support for people without taking power away, with supporting them, hopefully to, to, to reclaim power that they've lost and their voice, which sometimes has been lost. And for many people, I do think it can be an opportunity to examine like what has gotten called crisis and what they can learn from that and how they can walk through the world what you know what's working for them what's not working for them I say that because I believe it to be true and I've seen it be true but I don't want it to be heard as this like once you're there you must sit down and examine your entire life because that's that would be and you know an, a misunderstanding of quite what I mean but I think it is an opportunity for a lot of people to without all the controls of the conventional system look at what's working or not working and not have to define it within the scope of the clinical language that has typically been used thank you yeah so I would I would just add some of the values that I that I believe at least for us are really harm hallmarks of what the respite is and one is it is non-coercive in any way. We do not um, endorse, support, or uplift anything that feels pressure or feels forced or feels coercive. And so even to the extent of somebody saying, well, you can either go to the hospital, or you can go to the respite, that is coercion. And we do not honor or utilize any version of coercion. Consistent with that is complete autonomy, complete bodily autonomy, decision-making, autonomy, the physical space is your space. The bedroom that you are in is your bedroom while you're there. It's um, really critical that the environment um, speaks to healing and hope and well-being and connection in so many different ways. And that relationship is available um, as a significant component of it. That connection is one of, um, can be a really healing option for people when they're feeling so disconnected, either from themselves, their body, their experience, their family, their community, their identity, whatever the case may be, that we just offer connection and um, support people to find that whatever that means to them. So I do think it's important for people to understand the values that underpin a peer and respite, because oftentimes we go to the what it is and what it isn't, but we don't talk about the how and the why it is and, and isn't. Thank you. So go ahead, Chris. Okay, yeah, so before we go on, I'll just throw in, I think, you know, to me, the one distinguishing thing is hope. Like we give hope. Like if you go to a respite center, you should, I don't like to shit on people, but my experience is you leave with hope that you did, maybe didn't come in with. And that's to me distinguished from many clinical settings, if not most, um, but, Hope can happen anywhere. 
just it happens a lot at respite. Um, mental health legislation has been on the rise across the country generally, and some of it is aimed at or very near respite. Um, what legislation have you seen recently or do you see in the works that would impact respite where you are and how? And I think we've already touched on this a little bit, but if there's anything else you all wanted to add, now's a good time. And uh, Sarah. All right, so we've got a lot of activity related to legislation that I think uh, could impact peer respite for better or worse. In our state, we have H3602 and S1238. I know numbers, uh, people don't necessarily need to remember. It is actually representative of peer respite le legislation specifically that myself and Ephraim Akiva, who is the director of AFIA Peer Respite, uh, have worked on with some attorneys in the state out of Mental Health Legal Advisors Committee to ask for at least one peer respite in each county of Massachusetts, including the first LGBTQIA plus peer respites. And so we're really hopeful about that. Ephraim in particular has done a lot of work to move that forward, and it would be a huge win for us to, to gain any ground there, I think. And I've also seen similar legis legislation happening in Vermont and other spots as well. On the other hand, we also have a big push this year for involuntary outpatient commitment, uh, which is H694 and S980 uh, in our state. And you know that could be devastating to any of the voluntary off offerings because it could redirect all these funds into force and all the things, frankly, that if we do want to take an honest look at the research shows leads to poorer outcomes and harm to people. And so we're really hoping that doesn't happen. At the same time, we're also seeing legislation about emergency room diversion, which has the potential to, again, push resources towards alternatives. So we're really happy for that. And uh, you know some some other related legislation that is about alternatives to policing and anything that supports alternative uh, crisis responses. It, we've actually we've been able to work well with some of the alternatives to policing programs that have started in our state and create more alternatives through our collaborations with them. So it's it's mixed, uh, and I'm really I'm worried based on what I'm seeing in New York City and other places, but I'm also really hopeful that some of this could get through. It is no doubt mixed, right? So we have out of Oregon, House Bill, actually I think it was Senate Bill 680, which would create direct appropriations for peer-run respites in the state. In our state, we um, were able to submit and get um, bipartisan sponsorship for a IBC data transparency and collection bill. I will tell you, we got the most resistance out of that IBC data and collection bill than any other bills that we have um, been um, supporting and, and been involved in. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Simultaneous to our IBC bill, we had a bill um, to support pilots of non-carceral peer-run alternatives in our state. And we had a bill for non-carceral, non-police community response teams. So those were positive things. Um, I will say regarding the IVC data bill, um, it's unfortunate, but we had to gather our own data around involuntary commitment in our state because it wasn't gathered, it wasn't reported, it wasn't transparent, and that's what led us to requesting the bill. The bill did not pass, um, but since we are now working with, we are at 40 families whose children from ages five to 19 um, have recently been harmed through the course of involuntary commitment, forced treatment, emergency department boarding, and inpatient settings. And those families have um, organized, are mobilizing, and they're looking at policy change, as well as some social justice and community awareness issues. The last thing I, I do want to say, because it's more of a national issue, is I've received several calls asking me if I would support a bill for Medicaid to fund peer run respites and peer run alternatives. Um, I do not at this point. I uh, My experience with Medicaid is that it creates a medicalized, clinicalized version of something that was supposed to be very authentic and genuine. And, you know, and I used um, Massachusetts as the example, I used Georgia as the example. As soon as Medicaid starts funding things like peer and respites, state mental health block grant dollars and other sources of funding will easily come in and say, well, there's another funding source for, for that. And they no longer become open access affirming environments that don't require 
all the clinical assessments and referrals on the front end um, and the barriers that Medicaid creates. And so my cautionary tale is always, and what I urge people to do um, is to organize and ask the right question, which is not should Medicaid pay for peer run alternatives, but what would it take for Medicaid to fund these things and keep them um, based on integrity, fidelity, and authenticity? Yeah, I think the Medicaid question is one I think about a lot. Um, Wisconsin is not on the forward thinking curve as far as mental health legislation, especially this year with the new uh, governor budget and joint finance committee not including provisions for peer run respite in their recommendations recently. Um, but now that you say that, Shereen, I was thinking um, the mental health legislation I've been paying attention to is something called Act 122 in Wisconsin, which is a an act to create a billable code underneath Medicaid, Medicare for what's called peer recovery coaches, um, whatever that means. So when I see that, um, especially with them intertwined within overdose prevention and response and being tasked with service navigation um, and resource connection, especially when it comes to stepping people down from housing services or emergency detentions or ER visits after an overdose, um, what I see is a huge risk for the potential for coercive uh, referrals to a respite under the guise of, you know, I'm a peer recovery coach, which in my opinion isn't a thing because you can't be a peer and a coach at the same time. Um, and I feel very strongly about that. So, and I'm open to speaking more about that. Um, but I do think the idea of coaching someone into attending a respite or having a coaching relationship with them creates an immediate power differential where you are instructing and leading a person or guiding and influencing them. And when I see peer recovery coaches being interlaced within integrated services, I have a real concern that that's going to turn into a segue from hospitals into respites um, and that we'll lose the meaning of respites and they'll become informal, um, non medical stabilization centers and used as a tool to lessen costs of psychiatric um, hospitals, which is certainly a benefit, but in my opinion, not the sole intention or purpose of a respite existing. Um, I, I will say uh, briefly that uh, thankfully at this time, uh, our peer support wellness and respite centers are not, we, we do not, we're not Medicaid billable. We do not bill Medicaid here in Georgia for our respite centers. Um, and it's something that I believe if we had to do that, it, we could no longer call it a, a peer run respite. Um, uh, we have seen here, and Chris, I'm going to let you chime in here because you are a legislative um, guru and champion, but we have seen, you know, the real push towards um, outpatient committal, and, and, and moving funds, we have seen, it seems as administrations change and, and as personal beliefs of those who are in the administration change with them, you know, we've seen the, the, the turn towards, you know, let's put money towards hospital beds and things like that again. And so it swings as, as, as you know, people, as, as positions change and people change, the pendulum kind of swings and goes with, you know, those personal kinds of understandings and preferences is what I've seen. And, and um, I, I call on Chris just because he's, he has done lots down at the Capitol fighting for us. You know, again, you know, we, we were at the place of losing a bunch of money, um, several million dollars, you know, from our organization. And Chris went down and, and did, you know, gave a good fight. And, and, and we were able, you know, to hold on to the money with no increases, but they, 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 they at least gave us um, back the money that they were going to take. And so, Chris, I'll give it to you with that. Yeah, the, <clears throat> that pendulum and the constant need for education about what we do and what we are and who we are and what we value is um, just it's an impossible cycle. Like our, our legislature just changes so quickly, like every two years, every two years, every two years. And um, it identifying allies and potential allies, um, you know, it's a full-time job, which we can't fund. So it's, um, you know, it it is a struggle identifying the legislation, the, in particular um, for us, the 1013 bill, which was, you know, put forward as a mental health parity act. Um, the parity piece was less than half the document. It was a lot of other stuff put in there to sort of a wish list of people with, you know, an interest in mental health, mental health legislation. And working with and through that system to keep true to our core values as is, um, 
a lot of work. So the particular legislation that we're looking at right now, um, 520, but also, um, you know, involuntary commitment is expected to be a big topic here in Georgia as well coming up this year. We don't know like which specific legislation is being written now, but our understanding is that there's some being written or some being drafted right now that would um, not support the peer recovery movement for sure. Um, moving on from there, um, unless anyone has anything else they'd like to add in, I'm having trouble figuring out where to look today, which camera I'm on or at. Um, if anyone has anything else they'd like to add about the legislative piece before we move on. I do want, there are a couple of things that I just want to call attention to. One is with the advent of 988, um, it, it is very concerning to me that that the model that was designed was somebody to call, somebody to respond and a place to go and did not include um, support to actually stay at home in your community. So the we went right from somebody to respond to going someplace, uh, which is always concerning. Um, but then, you know, the someplace to call is a clinically based call center. The somebody to respond or mobile crisis teams with clinicians that maybe hire one peer support specialist. If we're lucky and a place to go is a crisis stabilization unit or crisis residential unit. So it's all still rooted in a very clinical paradigm, worldview and bias. And so when we're looking at 988, building out a crisis continuum of diversion prevention alternatives, Become, become critical um, to be able to influence that legislation and also what is gonna happen um, as we move forward. Same thing with CCBHDs. We got, there is funding for, for CCBHDs, there is legislation for CCBHDs, but it really is wide open in terms of the peer role. Um, some states are requiring CCBHDs to hire peer support specialists. Some are saying you can contract with peer-run organizations. Um, SAMHSA has said you can fund standalone peer-run respites and peer-run warm lines and things like that. The language is not enough to ensure that these type of options are rightful hands and they don't just become assumed under comprehensive behavioral health clinics. So again, become more clinically minded and clinically centered. All right, Ross, you want to take the next question? Sure. Are, are we talking about the barriers or the 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 if we if our, our five year plan? I think we are on to our um, three biggest barriers, but it sounds like we covered them. But just so people know, <laughs> well, which three from our laundry list of barriers um, yeah. you think are the most important? That that would be helpful, I think. So so yes, the, which which three? The, what are the biggest barriers you think we're facing? when it comes to peer respite and future peer respite, at least as we know it. Go ahead, Sarah. Well, I mean, we've talked about co-optation, so I won't keep going on that thread. I will say that there's this uh, weird thing happening in this state right now where people are saying like, but we don't have the infrastructure for more peer respites. I'm like, well, how do you think we're going to get the infrastructure for more peer respites if you don't fund more peer respites? There's a, there's a lot of excuses, I think, and maybe lack of faith and trust in the fact that you need something to be happening in order to, to figure it out, or they need to invest the time and funds in helping to build that infrastructure and that just sort of living in that fear of it not quite existing already uh, holds us back. You know, many great things in this country have happened with systems change when you've just had to figure it out in the moment and, and not much good happens when we just kind of keep saying like, well, we're not ready for that yet. That said, there does need to be a preparation to also really invest the funds so it's not set up for failure. Sometimes things do get set up uh, really with insufficient support and it just, you know, demonstrates what opponents of it uh, intend, which is, oh, it didn't work, look, you know, so I think both things need to happen and both are, are barriers. Yeah, apart from all the other things we already talked about, um, I think my three major barriers are actually all different than even things we brought up. Um, I like what you said, Sarah, of like, we don't get anywhere when we say we're not ready for this, because I think the, the biggest barrier I see is the commitment to the culture shift. 
um, the worry about what will happen if we allow people with lived experience to actually support one another like they have always done historically before respites even formally existed. Um, the lack of trust we have in ourselves as people with lived experience, the internalized oppression that then replicates in clinical attitudes. Um, I think the lack of public education around respites and movement history being promoted and widely shared and funded to have to have that being actually carried out is, is a big barrier. Um, but also just a, a, along with the culture shift, um, I, I want to just say it nicely, I guess, a gap in skill development in the peer support workforce and a lack of commitment to truly embodying the values separate from how that affects me on a personal level. Um, I think it we have a lack of capacity in the peer workforce for people who are truly committed um, and able to, um, in, a, in a professional sense or a personal sense or both, sitting with people in complex emotional distress and high risk situations and having a sense of trust and solidarity with someone and resisting the impulse to um, put my own agenda forth, even if that means intentionally putting someone toward a respite. Because even if that's what I think the person should have, um, quote unquote, that ability to center choice, I think in the workforce is still lacking. And that extends beyond peer respites. That's a peer support issue in itself. Um, and I think some of that work can happen in a skill development sense, and some of that is personal growth, shedding the saviordom mindset. Um, the co-optation happens by way of us as well. It's not just the system. We're also complicit in that system where we're not holding one another accountable and, and talking about the, real, the reality of what happens when your own stuff shows up in a way that makes the work um, diluted and even just a, a replication of clinical treatment systems. So that's something we've I've talked about endlessly with some people. Well said, and I would say the the additional to the internalized stigma uh, is the um, adopting um, a level of what we have seen uh, oppressive attitudes within systems. So it becomes competition, or it's an ego. You know, my ego ego can easily um, lead the day, and it's no longer about about you or us, a relationship or community. It's about me as a helper and you as a healthy so that hierarchy can easily get in the way. So we are recreating some of the oppression that has led us in the situation that we're in um, under the guise of, I have lived experience and I'm here to help you. So I'm seeing that happen a lot. So that's that workforce piece of it. I also see a significant institutional bias um, still where it's safer to send people to a locked place um, than it is to a, a voluntary non-coercive healing environment. And, you know, we don't accept that in any other parts of our lives, um, even in our medical care. We, especially in our medical care for physical health, we have options to deny treatment, to get second opinions, to have the least restrictive option available to us. But that is not afforded to us when it comes to mental health um, or substance use um, well-being. And so that's very concerning. And then of course, that the whole clinical worldview of safety and health, you overlay all of that, that we have a predetermined definition of what that means, which really equates to the only option is to be hospitalized or go to a crisis center. Um, so that's a lot, right, for us to, to be able to work through and overcome. And then my last one is that capacity building, Sarah, and, and I agree it's an and. There's a it's not gonna happen if it doesn't happen. And we also wanna support these things um, to be as successful as they possibly can. When I started PRN in 2005, I didn't have mentors. And, and I, I say both lovingly and honestly, I was not a CEO, I was a mental patient that had to learn how to do cost projections and HR and quality assurance and all the things that I did not go to school for because I was busy surviving at that time. And so there is an equity gap in terms of knowledge and exposure to how to do these things because that wasn't the life that many of us were living at that time. We didn't have those same opportunities. And so it's not lack of skill, it's lack of exposure and lack of knowledge and lack of, of uh, information. And so that to me is the capacity building that needs to happen. Um, where I sit. Um, I just quickly, beautifully said, I, I, the, the the workforce gap, um, the the equity in knowledge, skills, what have you. I I I, I echo that. I appreciate you saying that. Um, it's, it's something that I've thought for a long time. Um, 
and the 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 the, the tendency to kind of fall into um, the the traditional kind of clinical practices. You know, as 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 we get in position to you know really be able to support others, our, 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 it seems we get more co-opted, or we 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 go back to and rely on those things that happen to us. Even if we hated those things, we start to 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 you know perpetrate those things upon other people. Um, and and I think that goes to to uh, skills development, knowledge. Um, it 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 it's a it's a. I think that is a. It's a difficult thing to to um, address with folks and, and to to you know and to know how to move people from that because it's like this internal thing that's almost a default that that comes up at some point. Um, and so I, I really just appreciate everything that you all said, Chris. Is there anything you want to add to that? Well, I just see a parallel with the conversation we've been having here in Georgia, where the peer. Um, support workforce is considered a workforce development piece for the state. Um, that's the way our funding works. And, you know, part of that being a, a, the ability to provide amazing peer support does not equate to the ability to write an amazing note or have amazing like technology skills to like be able to write that note the way they want it written in their software and stuff. You know, it's like there are different skill sets and I think that's true organizationally as well, and just like conceptually, like what is it we're what is it we're doing? And I think asking that question each time we sit down to meet with folks and doing our planning and things, you know, like our goals, our projections, like what is it we're asking for and what do we want to achieve is so important in just keeping true to ourselves. And, right. Yeah. Go ahead, Bros. Okay, I was just going to ask a great segue to, to our next question, um, and that is, if you were put in charge of creating or expanding respite in your state today, what would your realistic goals be for your five-year and 10-year marks? I'm looking to see who's going to hit the button first. Go ahead, Sam. <laughs> oh, Shereen. Shereen got it first. Go ahead, Shereen. <laughs> well, so we are, we are actually doing that as we speak. So we are in the process of... Um, uh, supporting the startup of a second and third respite in different regions of our state. And we're, we want to be very intentional about scaling and replicability um, because there are a lot of lessons learned that we had to do the hard way. And, and some of them, frankly, we called a FIA and said, what the heck? You know, we didn't, we, we didn't know this or, you know, we wished we had known or what do you think about this? And so some of it really did come from that lessons learned and then reaching out as SOS for other people that have been doing um, respites longer and saying, okay, help us. What are we missing? What are we not doing? What are we understanding? And so we wanted to be very intentional about the replication and scaling of peer and respites, starting with standards and finding, well, it doesn't necessarily start with standards. For us, it started with convening a group of local leaders. I feel very strongly that opportunities and options need to happen by community, with community for community. We have been asked to take what we do, um, which now is 20 different programs. We're, we, we're not a small agency anymore, but we've been asked to take what we do and just bring it into another community. And I say every single time, that's not how this works. You don't want the Walmart of peer run respites. We've seen what happens when we're trying to create big box um, replication, Xerox of a Xerox of, of a Xerox. It's got to come from community by community with community. And so what I would be happy to do is support gatherings and coalitions of local community leaders and partners and allies to come together and examine whether a respite is even what they want, what variation, what does it look like, what are the adaptations, um, how similar or dissimilar to how we've done it in our city. And then they decide together, do they want it to be us running it? Do they want us to incubate it, but they then spin it off? Do they want to start it up as a grassroots community? All of those things have to be an option. And so that's my very long-winded way of saying that we are not in the business of just, you know, we're not creating an empire here. We are creating things that live in community that have got to be sustainable and they have to have soul and they have to have integrity. Other than that, there's so many unintended consequences of not getting it done right. Um, and there are unintended consequences of things that we didn't foresee 
And we just want to support people to avoid those things and, and do it to their greatness. Go ahead, Sarah. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of what Shireen said is is very important. Like, how do we create, you know, the how do we strengthen the understanding of what peer respite is? And there's some national work happening on that now too. You know, what's the integrity, the basic components of something that is called peer respite, while still leaving the flexibility for each community to really have strength in how the peer respite develops there. Uh, I do think that peer respite as an alternative is essential to, to many communities, even if it doesn't look exactly the same in each community. And I also think that as we go through these five and 10 years, I want funders and others to understand that peer respite is not the answer to everything. You can't simply drop a peer respite into a community and say, look, we have an alternative now, done. <laughs> and that's sometimes the approach, actually often the approach when funders and others start to buy in. They're like, well, we gave you an alternative. What else do you want? I do think that peer respite serves a lot of people really well. I think soteria houses would also serve a lot of people really well. I think other alternatives that have not yet been named in some particular branded way serve a lot of people really well. And we need to really expand into creating, you know, many opportunities uh, beyond peer respite, but with peer respite, a real, a real critical piece of that. And so I'm looking forward to that and to continuing to grow the seriousness with which these alternatives are taken I, you know i my in my fantasy land i don't know that it happens in the next five to ten years in my fantasy land much like the western laplands of finland transformed their entire mental health system into this open dialogue approach uh whatever its perfection you know pluses and minuses might be i'd love for us to not always be the alternative <laughs> And, and make real changes to how these mental health systems actually work because it's it's hard to see people go through institutionalization and then finally discover oh there's an alternative and a way to get out of it like how do we really get these things into the communities enough that they can be the supports that are offered not just the alternative so that's something I really want to figure out how to keep pushing forward whether or not it is achieved in the next five years. Yeah, I love what you said, Sarah, especially about, um, you know, it not having to be just the alternative. I think I don't know that I have enough faith in the system as itself to think that um, optimistically, but I think what I would love is for it to not be just an alternative specifically for people who are uh, historically marginalized or historically excluded groups. Um, I So in, when I see the question, you know, expanding or creating a respite, um, just transparently, the respite I came into two years ago was not really being used as a respite. It was kind of uh, a day spa for people that had the privilege of knowing what a respite was, who were deemed acceptable by the people who were working there that shared similar backgrounds and identities that did not really comprise of um, layered oppressions or experiences of loss of control or power. Um, so we kind of had to create or expand the respite to truly serve the community, which involved um, hiring people that actually reflected the people who are most impacted by systems in our area um, and creating accessibility for employment and flexibility with training. Um, and five-year goals, I, I feel like a five-year goal would just be maintaining that um, inclusive kind of staff composition and adhering to the values, which so far I think we're really on track. And in 10 years, I think the most I hope for is that we continue to exist and that we're um, adequately funded and padded with some more dollars to pay people well. Um, and I would hope that then we're not um, bent toward the will of Medicaid or you know, systemic desires. I don't know that I can dream larger than that at this point because I don't know that the buy-in is truly there, but I would love for respites to become a mainstay of support for people that deliberately need to circumvent um, crisis systems and 
settings that offer seclusion, restraint, and all those things, the medical model, um, because it's known widely that this is available, this is deserved, and that we need these things because we don't experience the same treatment um, or humane care in medical settings. So that's my dream for a five-year, 10-year goal, is I would love the, the respite to be the number one, you know, opportunity or call or the, the first thought in someone's head if they're going to face potential violence by the state or police intervention. I hope that it becomes something that's just known as I actually call respite first, if that's what I want for myself. Thank you all. Go ahead, Chris, you got one more question. I'm just well, going to just real quick, because we had some questions in here about data, because I really want to know like what kind of data you all are collecting that you hope to use in the future. Um, the Because nothing right now is more important in the state of Georgia than data collection. And um, I just want to hear what you guys are doing. What you all are doing. <laughs> Northern came out with the guys. Oh, I'm sorry, Sarah, go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, we, it, collecting a collection of data is really tricky. People have fa found, you know, that they've been followed around by data and notes and things like that uh, in very harmful ways. So we really try to minimize it. But largely what we're looking at, uh, you know, we do a short term voluntary survey that where people can talk about, did they experience more respect in, uh, in staying there? Did they feel more connected to a community in staying there? Did they have those sorts of experiences? Uh, and then longer term, we're just asking people, you know, how did this impact your life? Has it, uh, do you feel more connected to a community beyond, you know, it's like, I, it's hard to talk about it in like the 60 second version, but we're really focusing on connection, quality of life, people living the life they want to live and being able to continue to avoid the carceral coercive force settings that cause them harm. And, and we really do it in a very voluntary way that tries to be really minimize invasiveness and uh, note taking and all of that. Anyone have anything else they would like to add? So I will add, so yes, that's that's the crux of what we are, what we are um, gathering as well is quality of life. Would you come back? Where would you have been if you weren't here? Um, continuing a relationship. I do think it's important. I was negligent to say that I get concerned about um, just a peer respite as a solution and a standalone because I think what rep peer respite represents is an option that is openly accessible to all folks experiencing distress with um, connection, peer to peer to peer support, affirming humanity, healing. And there needs to be an array of those options, not just a peer run respite. And so some of what we are asking is about connection to um, other things that are offered that either have been useful, would be useful, or whether you are continuing to be connected to communities in that way. Um, we are asking and want to know about hospital diversion, jail diversion. That includes our team. Like our funders want to know how many peer support specialists are working at a respite that have had carceral involvement themselves that have been involuntarily committed themselves, um, which I think is a very important thing for us to be able to talk about is our is is who's at the respite, who is providing um, or offering support at the respite as well. Um, we are asking questions about wait times. So from the time somebody reaches out about the respite, how long is it taking them to be able to come into the respite? Um, so that becomes an important piece of information. Um, so that's an access accessibility and then capacity issues, whether the need is, ex is um, exceeding what the capacity is that we have. The other data is data that we look in our community to be able to actually um, uh, advocate for respite, emergency department boarding, for example. So that's the number of people and for how long they're living in an emergency apartment, involuntary commitment, arrests, um, hospitalizations, costs of all of those things. We're looking to kind of sell why peer run respites are valid and needed. Awesome, thank you. Um, Roz, you wanna take us out? 
Um, yeah, I, I just want to say thank you to everyone that's been here. It's been a fascinating and amazing conversation. I just want to thank Sarah, Zay, and Shereen for, for, for just stepping up and being here. Um, I look forward to being in closer connection with each of you. Um, and this is, concludes our, our four-part series, and we've ended on a high note. Thank each of you for being here and for the work that you do. And remember to stick around if you want your continuing education units to complete the evaluation. Thank you all. Thank you all so much. Thank you.